Welcome to the next video lecture in Introduction to Machine Learning. This is going to be the fairly math-heavy introductory chapter to the random forest chapter. Um, but in this video, we're not going to be talking about random forests, actually. We are going to be talking about a prerequisite for random forests, which is called bagging. All right, what is bagging? <clears throat> bagging is a portmanteau word, sorry, abbreviation for bootstrap aggregation. It's a so-called ensemble method um, in the sense that it combines many models into one big super meta model. Um, and there are many different ways to um, create such ensembles of models. Um, it's very popular because they tend to work better than um, single models. Um, and here we're talking about bagging. Another way to construct ensembles is boosting. And another way would be stacking. Okay. Um, but here we'll talk about bagging. Um, and if we talk about ensembles, we have to learn some new terminology. So all the models that are part of a, such an ensemble are called base learners. Yeah, so every model is a learner and uh, comes from a learner and each of these will be a base learner. Okay, so that's just terminology. All right, um, so how does bagging work? Well, in a bagging ensemble, all the members of the ensemble are models, base learners of the same type. Yeah, so you do a bagging of three base learners or a bottle or a, a bagging of uh, re linear regression base learners, stuff like that. The only difference between the different ensemble members, the different base learners, is that they're always trained on slightly different versions of the training data. Specifically, what we do in bagging, bootstrap aggregation, is that we draw capital M bootstrap samples of the training data. So a bootstrap sample, remember, that's um, sampling with replacement a data set of the same size as the original one from the original data set. So we'll have a couple of observations in there that um, come in more than once and a couple of observations that don't get drawn at all. Yeah, so that's a bootstrap sample. And we'll also call the base learners, the members of, the, of our ensemble, sorry, we'll call them B, and then in a superscript in brackets m x because well we have m going from one to capital m of those yeah so <clears throat> the idea here is we draw n observations from our data set with replacement that's a bootstrap sample and then we fit the same kind of model to each of these bootstrap samples to get well then capital M different base learner models estimated from these different bootstrap samples. Yeah, so we take the original data, we basically make slightly mutated copies of it, and then we train our model on each of these slightly different data sets. So we get slightly different models. Yeah. Um, and then once we've done that, we aggregate combine the predictions of these M fitted models to get an ensemble model and the ensemble method we'll call F hat and here in the superscript a capital M yeah, to indicate that this is something that comes from combining capital M different base learner models. <clears throat> okay, if we do regression we do this aggregation by simple ab simply averaging the predictions of the different ensemble members. Um, in classification, we typically do majority voting. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> something like posterior class probabilities for classification, you can get them from 
estimating basically the relative frequencies of the predictions that your ensemble members give you. Yeah, so here's an example below. Um, we have an ensemble with three trees. Yeah, so these are my these are the three models that we have, and now we feed an observation into this tree. So for the first ensemble member, it goes this way. For the second ensemble member, it also goes this way. And for the third ensemble member, it goes this way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and now, yeah, here we have the different predictions for classification. It predicts one twice, predicts zero one time. So majority voting would say we um, predict y with uh, we predict y equals one, and the posterior probability here would be two thirds because two of the three ensemble members predicted um, class one. Yeah, and similarly for regression, this is how that works. All right. Um, now the question is why does this work? So why or under which circumstances can I actually get a better prediction from averaging a number of models that were each only trained on a subset of the data? All right, and the reason why this works is because if you think about the variability of an average of a number of values, yeah, is always smaller than the variability of one of these values by itself. So if we're thinking about this as like a, a random thing that our models, that our models predictions are in some sense random because well, they depend on the specifics of the data that we use to train them. Then we can reduce the variability of our model predictions by averaging over many different versions of the same kind of prediction. Yeah? So we can reduce the variability there. And if the error that we make is mostly due to this random variability, this, this instability of the learned model, so that, you know, get slightly different data, get a slightly different model, gives you slightly different predictions. If that <clears throat> is mostly the reason for why you're making an error, um, then you can become better. So if, if on, on average you do the right prediction, only there's some variance about the true value, yeah, then averaging a bunch of these random predictions, which are all off by some little small way, will improve your predictions. Yeah. Vice versa, if your models make systematic errors, yeah, so the model for some reason is such that it tends to always underestimate uh, the, the value by some, I don't know, two units or something. Then averaging a lot of these systematically biased predictions doesn't really help you in reducing the error. Okay, so it works. Bagging works well. And that's the first thing we can take away from that. The bagging works well if you have base learners um, where the predictions are somewhat variable and sensitive to the input data and not systematically biased. Okay, um, <clears throat> now, don't be scared. We're gonna um, formalize this a little bit more uh, because it's an interesting topic. Um, so we'll make an analysis of what properties these base learner models have to have and our problem has to have in order for bagging to help us. And we'll do that um, for a fairly simplified example um, for a quadratic loss. Okay, so again, notation. We have this thing here, that's our ensemble model. That's the average of all the different base learner models BMX, okay? And now here in the first line, we are defining a new quantity that we haven't seen, seen before. We're defining the instability of an ensemble, denoted here by delta. And that is essentially the variance of the individual base learner predictions. Yeah, so I'm using a base learner prediction here. That's a function of x. Yeah, but let's say we're keeping x fixed. And um, that's a function of x 
minus the average of all base ones. So I'm taking one realization of the variable minus the mean of all of these variables. And I'm taking, I'm squaring them and I'm taking the average of that. So we could call this the instability of the ensemble or we could just call it the variance of the ensemble members predictions, basically. Okay, so let's, let's look at how we can simplify this. So this is just the definition. The instability of the ensemble is defined as the average squared difference between that, between one of the base learners prediction and what the ensemble in its entirety would predict. Okay, now, first step, we can just add a creative zero in this um, square bracket, right? So here we can, we subtract y, the true value of the target value of the target variable, and here we add y. So we haven't changed the value of the equation. Um, but now we can pull this together because we say we use quadratic loss. So if we look at um, this difference squared, this is just the loss function for one of the ensemble members, right? So this thing squared and then just taken out of the sum, that's the loss for one of the base learners. This thing here, similarly, that's the square difference between the actual target value and the prediction of the entire ensemble. So that's the loss function for the entire ensemble. Okay, and now what's left here is the mixed term of that quadratic equation. So it's minus two this times this. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I have is I have minus two, okay, y minus this, yeah, this uh, comes from the comes from the first uh, part of this uh, thing here, and the other term is this here. So it's y minus the um, y minus the the model, yeah. Um, all right. So, now we've decomposed this instability of the ensemble into these three terms. What we actually, and, and you can see here, sorry, and we can further simplify this because this average of the base learners, that's just FM itself. So what we have here, in fact, is just um, minus two times the loss um, of the ensemble. So we can subtract that from here. And so actually what we have here, the instability of the ensemble is the difference between the average of the loss function of the individual <coughs> base learners minus the loss function for quadratic loss of the ensemble. Yeah, so because this, uh, this simplifies this nicely. Now, what we actually care about is actually the loss function of the ensemble. So now let's, let's take this equation up here and let's look specifically at this term minus um, L, this, this minus this, this uh, loss function of the entire ensemble. But let's take the expectation of that equation over the data distribution and let's also move this quantity, this minus the loss function of fm, let's move this to the left side and let's move this quantity, this um, instability of the ensemble, let's move that to the to right side, so subtract it. Yeah, so, and now we take the expected value of that. And, and this is actually, I think, fairly instructive because what we see here is that the expectation of the loss function of the entire ensemble the expectation over the joint distribution of x and y. That's the average expected loss of overall individual ensemble members minus the expected instability of the ensemble. So that means the expected loss of the ensemble is decreased 
as compared to the average expected loss of a single bass liner by the amount of instability in the ensemble's bass liners. Okay? So that means that first, you know, so first level of analysis, that means that if we want to have a loss of our ensemble that's as small as possible, well, we make this as small as possible and this as big as possible. So this as small as possible means that each of these bass learners, obviously, should already be fairly accurate and give good predictions. And maximizing this means, okay, so we want the models that come out of these bass learners, yeah, we want them to be as different as possible. So high instability, so to say, of the ensemble. All right, um, now, how do we make this instability as large as possible? How do we do that? Okay, so again, let's, let's write that else. Yeah, we, we, want to, we want to minimize this. We want to minimize the loss of the ensemble. Um, we can't really do anything about the accuracy of the bass learners themselves, but maybe we can do something about this. Yeah, so we want to make this as large as possible so to reduce the expected loss of the ensemble. Now, we'll make some very strong simplifying assumptions so that we can um, derive this in one page. Obviously, these may be not so realistic, but still instructive to do it. So we'll assume for simplicity that the expected prediction for any base learner for any over x and y is just zero. Yeah, so we can that basically drops out. Um, well, then, if if the expected value is zero, then the variance of the base learner predictions that's simply the expectation of the squared prediction. Let's call that sigma squared. Yeah. That's the variance of the base learner's predictions. Um, and we'll also assume, I mean, all of these base learners are trained on similar versions of the same training data. So they won't be completely independent. Yeah, they will be, they, they will do similar things. Um, so let's say the correlation between two members, M and M trace of our ensemble is always rho. Yeah, so that's, it's always the same. They, they always have the same correlation value. Yeah, that uh, makes things um, a little bit easier. Okay. Now, very, um, well, fairly basic uh, probability math then tells us that under these assumptions, yeah, the variance of the ensemble itself is very simply, um, the variance of each of the ensemble members divided by m. Yeah, that's just basically the variance of the average of independent quantities. And then because these quantities that we're averaging over, they're not actually independent, we have to also consider their correlation. So um, the variance of the ensemble gets increased by this term here, which depends on the correlation and the variance and the size of the ensemble. Okay. Um, if you don't believe that, um, try to derive it yourself. That's a very good um, exercise in terms of dealing with variances and expectations and so on. Okay, um, so if we have that, <clears throat> now we're ready to take a look at the expected value of the instability of the ensemble. Yeah, the instability of the ensemble is just defined as the square difference between the individual base learner predictions and the entire ensemble's predictions. So we're squaring those. Um, and we're taking the expectation. Yeah? We, so we can pull the expectation into that sum, as we always do. Okay, um, and now um, we just basically compute this um, square equation, this quadratic equation, and take the expectation of each uh, resulting term. So we have, okay, we have this factor here. 
So we take the expectation of bmx squared. We take in the expectation of that, but that won't change <clears throat> with the index m, yeah, because the expectation of the base runner, that's, uh, we said that's always the same. <clears throat> so this first term, one over m times m times the expected value of the squared based on a prediction, that expectation of the squared based on a prediction, that's just sigma squared. So here we have sigma squared for that first term. Okay. Second term from the quadratic equation, fmx squared. Okay. Taking the expectation of that, that's m times the expectation of that. Here we have one over m. So that just cancels out. So we have an expectation of the squared based on a prediction. Okay. And now the mixed term, that's minus two times the product of bmx and fmx. So, okay, this is slightly more complicated now. We have, um, <clears throat> all right. So we have um, 2m expectation over xy of this product, okay? Now, um, fmx, that's actually 1 over m times um, the sum yeah, of the base runners. So we can decompose fmx into the sum of base runners and write it, write it out in that sum. So what we actually have here is the sum over the expectations of the product of BM with BM trace. Yeah. And the expectation of the product of two random variables, that's, uh, well, we can use the formula for the covariance because we know the covariance of two random variables is always the expectation of their product minus the product of their expectations, yeah? So uh, we can write this expectation of the product as the covariance plus the product of their expectations. And now we can simplify this even further because, okay, sigma square st stays sigma square. The expected value of the squared ensemble prediction, we that's the variance of the ensemble predictions in our case. So we um, already derived that here. So we can just pull this down here. And now here we have, okay, we have M minus one terms here where we compute the covariance between, um, <clears throat> so, oh, sorry. So we have minus two times, okay, one over M. Then here we have the covariance of the two, yeah? So the, the covariance is um, simply rho times sigma squared, yeah? Because the correlation is rho, so the covariance is rho times sigma squared. So that's what we have here. Then um, we also have one term in the sum here where m and m trace are actually the same thing. So there we need the we need the variance. So we have m minus one times the covariance, and we have one time the variance of the base learners. Okay, and the expectation of the base learner, we said that is zero. So that last part here cancels out. It's just zero times zero. And if we pull all that together, what we get under these very strong simplifying assumptions is that the expected instability of the ensemble looks like this. All right, lots of math. Let's, um, first of all, yeah. if you got lost here, please do pause the video. Try to understand how we go from each step to each step. Remember the computation rules for expectations and variances. Um, and try to derive this for yourself. Um, but now, 
we go on to our result. So <clears throat> the first step of the analysis was that we looked at the expected loss of the entire ensemble. And we saw that we can write the expected loss of the entire ensemble as um, the first of all the average loss of each of the ensemble members of the base learners BM minus the expected instability of the ensemble. Yeah? And so um, we said, okay, well, this is the blue part here. Well, you know, if we want to minimize the loss of our ensemble, obviously it's a good idea to pick base learners that are already working fairly well individual. So better base learners are better. Yeah, that's how we get an improvement through bagging. Better base learners. Now, for the other parts, we have to look at the expected value of the instability. And the expected value of the instability, if you go back to the previous slides, now this is written out more explicitly here what these quantities actually mean. We have one factor here that's related to the size of the ensemble. Yeah? This will be closer to one the more base learners you have. Yeah? So more base learners are better, theoretically at least. And obviously, you know, once you have reached a certain size, it doesn't really matter all that much, I would say. Yeah? Whether you using whether this is 499 divided by 500 or whether this is 199 divided by 200 well it doesn't really matter too much so this is practically one what's more important here is these two terms so we want to yeah as i said we want to maximize uh, this so we can subtract as much as possible from the average expected loss of each individual baseline yeah so this term here that's specifically the variance of the base learner. So more variable base learners are better as long as you know, the average risk stays the same. But in principle, we want base learners that are very variable. So they're very sensitive to changes in the training data. Um, and then here we have one minus the correlation between two different base learners call it the average correlation between base learners maybe more realistically so we want something that has as little correlation between the base learners as possible yeah? because obviously building an ensemble will only work well if basically your base learners make different errors in different directions if if they all agree on overestimating something you have no benefit from averaging these overestimations. You're still going to be over. Yeah? Whereas if the base learners are not correlated, so one of them overestimates, another underestimates, you take the average, you're fairly close to the truth. Yeah? So the errors cancel out. That's uh, basically the intuition of why you want as little correlation between the base learners as possible while still having base learners that are all fairly accurate. So some degree of correlation is unavoidable yeah all right um summing this up the basic idea here is that we fit the same model repeatedly on bootstrap applications of the training data set and then we aggregate the result we gain performance predictive performance here by reducing the variance of the predictions um this also slightly increases the bias sometimes because we're reusing training data many times. That's an aspect that we haven't really talked about here because it's not so easy to mathematically analyze. But yeah, that could happen. And it works best for base learners, ensemble members, that are fairly unstable, that have high variance, where fairly small changes in the training data set can cause fairly large changes in prediction. And techniques for which this is true, would be, for example, classification and regression trees. Yeah, we remember that uh, we talked about this, that they are very unstable, which is bad if we use them as simple models, but very, very good if we use them as ensemble members. Other examples would include neural networks or stepwise selection methods for regression. Yeah. 
Um, it works best if the baseliner's predictions are only weakly correlated, so they don't all make mistakes that go in the same direction, so that by averaging the, their predictions, you, the errors kind of cancel out. Um, and it turns out that actually uh, bagging can make things worse if you apply it to uh, fairly stable methods like cavernous neighbors or, li or linear discriminant analysis, naive base or linear regression. All right, that's it for this uh, fairly math heavy uh, introduction to bagging. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience and do try to derive these equations yourselves.